Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 122 of the Gun Blog Variety Cast, a proud member of the Self Defense Radio Network. How are you doing, Aaron? Well, the good news is that Operation Blazing Sword is now up and running. We have our 501c3 status, we have a bank account and a link to PayPal account. I have a thank you letter slash tax receipt set up to send to people who donate. And uh, my next steps are getting us on Amazon Smile so that people can shop via our link and make donations to us that way and work on our webpage so that we aren't just a Facebook group. The bad news is that I haven't had time to do much of anything else these days, including writing on my blog. I'm a writer. That's my creative outlet. It's how I feel better about myself. And if I can't write for a week or more, it really leaves me feeling unhappy and and unfulfilled and rather like a slacker. So there's that. But, you know, the good news in all that is it's keeping my mind off of Christmas and uh, (laughs) the cinnamon-scented event horizon, which threatens... So, you know, we got some good, we got some bad. How are you doing, Sean? I've been doing pretty well, actually. One of the nice things about Walmart, which is one of the few places I'll actually go during the Christmas season, is I haven't noticed too much in the way of Christmas music coming over the Walmart speakers. So, good job, Walmart. Wow. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty well known for, like, if I was emperor, I would ban Christmas music, Christmas decorations, Christmas everything, until after a set day in the calendar. And my personal preference is that that day should be December 24th because December 23rd is my birthday. So it should be Emperor's birthday and then the Christmas season. And let's let's get the real 12 days of Christmas back, you know, Christmas to the Feast of Epiphany. Come on now. (laughs) This whole Christmas starting in November thing is irritating. And, you know, I just avoid all malls. Thank goodness I no longer watch TV because... I mean, like I watch Netflix and stuff, but I don't watch commercial TV, so I don't see the ads for Christmas. I'm not just battered to death by every kiss begins with K, only if she's a whore. Don't get me started on the whole biannual, if you love your woman, you will buy her a diamond, and if you don't, you are filth. Yeah. Oh, that drives me crazy. There was that one ad where, you know, he got the wrong thing for his wife and ended up living in the doghouse. Oh, jeez. God, I hate those things. Of course, if I'm being honest here, part of the reason it bugs me so much is that I've never had anyone in my life who cares about me so much that they would buy me a diamond. So there's probably a fair amount of jealousy (laughs) working into that as well. Well, nobody's ever bought me a diamond either, so. Yeah, but you're a boy. You don't care. Hey, tell me I'm pretty, Internet. (laughs) Uh, Were you unwed, I would take you in a manly fashion. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well be- because you're pretty because <laughs> i'm pretty i might as emperor allow christmas to drift back to say the 13th the 13th of december that way the 12th that would be emperor's parents day that's their anniversary and then the 13th we can go ahead and start decorating for christmas because for some reason everybody wants to get ready for christmas early and i honestly have never understood this I go to school, I'm in class, and then like a couple of days before Christmas, they would let us out. And then it was Christmas all of a sudden. And then there was that week and a half between Christmas and New Year's and getting back to school right after New Year's, right? And everybody is so burned out on Christmas by the time they get to that. They're cutting their trees down if they were, you know, standard tree trees or they're disassembling their fake trees and restowing everything and it's like the day after christmas they do christmas sales and then no more christmas and i've never understood that we didn't do that in my house in my house the tree didn't even show up until like the 17th that was like the planning day is the christmas tree to show up and we would get these giant like 12 foot trees that barely fit in the cathedral ceiling single story house i lived in And we would decorate the hell out of this Christmas tree. Every single ornament had to go on the tree. It looked like an ornament factory exploded. Yeah, my mom owns stock in Hallmark as well. (laughs) Well, there was everything from like, if you look at my parents, you know, if you go and find this stuff now in my parents' house, you'll find little like 
school pictures of me stuck to a plate because that's what you made when you were in the third grade. Mm -hmm. That stuff is still on the tree. My mid forties and my freaking kid pictures from the third grade are still on the Christmas tree. Love you. That was the rule. If there was a Christmas ornament, it went on the tree. It didn't matter if there was no room on the tree. You found room on the tree, right? If you were just being a <laughs> slacker. So it, there was theme trees. Now that didn't happen. Well, none of that happened until maybe a week before Christmas, maybe. And then the Christmas tree would last until after New Year's. And there was that long Christmas holiday season for us. And everybody else now is just burned out on it by the time they hit Christmas because they've been going Christmas, Christmas, Christmas since the day after Thanksgiving. And in some cases, the day after Halloween. Yeah, our family's Black Friday tradition is that I get up on the roof and string the roof lights while mom and dad put up the yard lights. Then we decorate the inside of the house. And normally, like up until this year, I have held very firm in my belief that you shouldn't decorate the house for Christmas until after Thanksgiving. And I'm starting to revise my opinion based solely upon the fact that my mother goes crazy every December. And and the short version is like this. She's one of those people who thinks that if things aren't perfect, the holiday is ruined. And she's got to have the interior decorations and the exterior decorations and all the baking and all of this and all of that. And she tries to do too much in the four weeks and she just drives herself nuts. And so I'm starting to think maybe, you know, maybe we should start decorating the house mid-Thanksgiving, give her a couple of weeks of buffer so that she's not just completely unlivable during December. Uh, I feel dirty just saying that. (laughs) I really think if we made it a, a, you know, an impaling offense or a crucifixion or death by burning at the stake (laughs) offense to put up Christmas decorations before a certain period of time, everybody would just figure out how to do it, right? But everybody keeps trying to creep backwards and backwards and backwards. And I honestly think that most people don't want that. Most people do not want to see Christmas before Thanksgiving. They want to at least get the turkey down. And unfortunately, the stores just keep pushing it backwards and pushing it backwards because, well, you know, they're keeping up with the Joneses. And I really wish we would stop because, honestly, the only reason that the season is not totally ruined for me is the fact that I am able to avoid all of it because I don't go into stores and I don't watch commercial TV. I don't know how the rest of you people deal with it. I swear, by the time Christmas rolled around, if I had to deal with that every day, I'd be in a clock tower on a Texas campus. I drink heavily. By the way, I like rum. So, you know, if you want to send me a Christmas present, I'm, I'm actually fairly cheap. Just send me a bottle of Malibu rum. I will love you to death. Right. And you know what? For my part, y'all need to stop saying I'm hard to shop for. Surely you know where the gun store is. (laughs) Right? Call up Triangle Shooting Academy and say you want a gift card. It's all you need to do. Yeah, thank God for Amazon. It's like my brother and sister asked me, what do you want? It's just like, just just give me an Amazon card. I'll (laughs) buy my own stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And I don't want to come across like I hate Christmas because I love Christmas. I especially love Christmas now that I'm married. And every year for the last, I don't know how many, we've gone to my in-laws place. And it's just the four of us, me, my wife, and her parents. And we have this lovely Christmas where I cook breakfast and my wife cooks dinner, and in the middle there's Christmas presents and stockings, and it's just, it's wonderful. Stop burning people out on Christmas and messing it up for them. That's just not fair. Amen, brother. Beth shares her thoughts on a recent email she received that bashes her focus on women's issues within the firearms industry. You know, I definitely realize that you can't make all the people happy all the time. But I was actually really bothered by an email that came into me the other day that basically bashed me for standing up for women, especially in our industry, and for wanting to put content and products and information out there that's actually geared toward women. And honestly, that got me upset, but it also got me really, really confused. I just don't understand. Yes. I am a woman. And yes, I believe that it's important that women know how to defend themselves, protect themselves, 
and have the knowledge and the confidence to be able to use a firearm for themselves or for their family or both. I also believe that firearms are for everyone. I don't think it's a male thing. I don't think it's a female thing. I think it's an American thing. And I believe that all of us should have the right to not only have a firearm, but choose whatever firearm works the best for our lifestyles, for our body types, for our preferences, our needs, our limitations, whatever the case may be. So again, I found it really confusing and hurtful that someone actually reached out to me and told me that I was basically being a whiny baby. And apparently also I was pushing feminist propaganda and liberal misinformation just because I advocate for women's training, for people to pay attention to women's needs, for there to be options for women and, you know, for there to be things that are specifically for women by women. The funny thing is, one of this emailer's main points led to the fact that shooting is for everyone, which of course I agree with. And she mentioned that she was going to basically escape this women focus, women nonsense, whining, ranting, whatever the case may be. And she was going to go out to her local gun club, which in her words is almost all men. But isn't that exactly the point? Most local gun clubs and shooting ranges, I would dare say all, are typically comprised of men. And as this person stated, there is no woman focus. And along with that, there are no classes for women, no female instructors, no restroom facilities for women. A lot of times it's just porta potties. And there's no organizations that train up and build women shooters, no gear that fits women's bodies or needs. And that's exactly why there are so few women there. I think we have all learned that the way to appeal to somebody is to meet them where they are or to offer them something that interests them on their level, wherever they are in their journey in firearms. Women think differently, we dress differently, we approach topics in a very different way, and I believe that should not only be recognized, it should be celebrated. This is not feminism. This is not liberalism. It's not misinformation. And I wonder if she feels this way about all the organizations and people out there who are fighting for it to be normal and acceptable for women to have firearms and to train with firearms and to carry firearms. I mean, does she feel this way about NRA's programs like Woman on Target? Or what about organizations like A Girl in a Gun or The Well-Armed Woman? These groups have basically been trailblazers. They're not promoting feminist propaganda. I can't speak for any of those other groups, but I can speak for myself. And I can assure you, my goal with some of the content, products, and training that I am working on is to provide meaningful, relatable, motivational, and solid information, and sometimes, yes, geared toward women. At any rate, I fully respect what she's saying, but I also had to tell this woman that I respectfully disagree. And I am willing to stand in the gap to reach women who desire to be part of a gun community that accepts them, respects them, and desires good shooting for everyone, but still has the decency and the wherewithal to recognize that one size does not fit all. Until next time, stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the donate or the subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. And a little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. Man charged in attacks near Duke campus, also suspected in earlier robbery. Dateline, Durham, North Carolina. A Durham man arrested Tuesday in connection with two recent attacks near the Duke University campus is also charged with the robbery earlier in November, authorities said Wednesday. Suspect, 27, of 812 Underwood Avenue, apartment 12. Stop by and say hi is charged with first-degree kidnapping, second-degree forcible sex offense, robbery with a dangerous weapon, identity theft, and attempting to obtain property by false pretense in a November 30 incident where a woman was sexually assaulted at knife point along Swift Avenue and robbed of a credit card. 
He is also charged with robbery with a dangerous weapon, assault with a deadly weapon inflicting serious injury, and first-degree kidnapping in a Saturday attack on a woman at Sarah P. Duke Gardens involving a stun gun and a knife. Police have now charged him with common law robbery in the November 12th theft of a 1998 Toyota Avalon, according to an arrest warrant. Suspect was being held at the Durham County Jail under $3 million bond. Friends said he has mental health problems and is usually a good guy. Far as I've seen, he's not a bad guy. He's got a couple problems, but he's not a bad guy, James Johnson said. Everybody makes mistakes, and I just want to apologize to whoever he did this to, or if he did it. I just want to apologize on his behalf because, at the end of the day, we all make mistakes, said a friend who only identified herself as Michelle. That offered little comfort to Duke students. People are really afraid. It scares me a lot, especially because I feel like campuses are really safe places, Duke freshman Amanda Kahn said. I go to the gardens a lot to be alone because not a lot of people go there. So it's sad to know that it's not a good place to be alone. Okay, so I've been biting my tongue this entire time. He's a good guy? What? First degree kidnapping, second degree forcible sex offense, robbery with a dangerous weapon, identity theft, obtaining property by false pretenses, and then of course there's the common law robbery for the car. What kind of a good guy is this for crying out loud? Well, let's take a look. Breaking and entering vehicles attempted, misdemeanor, class 1. Two counts larceny, misdemeanor, class 1. Misdemeanor breaking and entering attempted, misdemeanor, class 1. Four counts felony breaking and entering, felon, class H. Four counts larceny after breaking and entering, felon, class H. Kidnapping in the second degree, felon, class E. And two counts of robbery with a dangerous weapon, felon, class D. Okay, this is where I have to break out the Princess Bride quote and go, Good guy? I do not think that word means what you think it means. I don't think so either. So for those who don't know, Duke University is a very, very prestigious university down here in Durham, North Carolina. It's, I don't know, Ivy League nearly? This is one of those places where your grades have to be fantastic and you have to do every kind of activity after school known to man just to get in. And we have the special snowflakes who are like, I like to go to the gardens. But now, uh, you know, it's not safe. Is life. Life is not safe. So Baron is on assignment and will return soon. Now, I wanted to let you guys know that Baron's having a rough time at work. He's trying to keep up with the demands on his time. It works going well for him, but wow, they are really running him hard. It's going to be a little while before he gets back to us. The main topic... So I finally broken out the new SIG P320 and I'm practicing because on Saturday, which would be a day before this show comes out, but you know, it's in our future because the way we're recording this, I am going to be going to an IDPA match. So All right. this has been a lot of fun. I've got a SIG P320 compact and I've actually never taken it to a range before. I am probably going to take my first shots with this in an IDPA match. That's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see how it turns out. Yeah, I know. Probably not the best planning in the world, but I haven't had an opportunity to take it to the range. I've been doing so many other things, and I don't want to carry this gun until I have taken it to an you know a class. I want to spend you know a couple hundred rounds shooting in a day just to be sure that the gun's fine because I've got a carry gun. This is going to be my new carry gun, but I don't want to just start carrying it and not know that it's going to handle, you know, a couple hundred rounds of, of actual shooting in a day. You know, I, I want to really know the gun before I'm willing to, to carry it around. The other gun I've already done that with. Isn't the conventional wisdom like 500 to 1,000 rounds before you start carrying it? You know what? That seems like reasonable. I could probably shoot this IDPA match. That's about 100 rounds. I'll probably put another 100 rounds at the next IDPA match. I'm hoping to get to what used to be Tiger Swan is now called the range complex. And I'm hoping to take it to a basic pistol class, which is another 500 rounds. I think at that point, once I go through that and I'm confident that it's reliable, that I can hit where I want to hit with it, I'm actually good at using the pistol. That's when I want to start thinking about carrying it. I've got the holster. I've got the mag carriers. I literally, I could put it on and I could, you know, I've even got defensive ammo for it. So I could load it up and just start carrying it now. But Do I really want to trust my life to something that I haven't verified, right? Especially when I got something already that works. All right. Makes sense. So what I've been doing on the lead up to this match is I've started dry firing again. And 
it's really nice having a garage. Oh my goodness. I'll just pull the car out of the garage and I'll take my little bench digger pro shop, little miniature dry fire targets and set them on the rail on the garage door. And then I just do my dry fire, shoot them at the garage door. All right. So I have a question here about safety. If you're dry firing, especially if you're dry firing at your garage door, how do you maintain firearm safety? I mean, it sounds like you're not following the the four rules uh, as given to us from on high by Colonel Cooper. That is true. You know, treat every gun as if it's loaded, but you have to be able to do the dry fire. So naturally, you know, something's got to give, doesn't it? What I've been doing is that I have a bunch of dummy rounds and all my mags are loaded with dummy rounds, 10 each, because that's the maximum in an IDPA match. That'll give me the weight on the magazines as I'm trying to do reloads and stuff, but it's dummy ammo. If I ever chamber it for some reason, then it's not going to go off because it's dummy ammo and it's really clearly marked. It was something that Luke from Triangle Tactical made for me. He has a bunch of old green zombie rounds. Oh yeah, the stuff from Hornady. I think, I, I, I'm not sure. I think they're actually just green powder coated bullets. But so he's got a reloading setup and he took some empty cartridge cases and we like put some brass black on it and then just loaded green rounds. So they're really, really obvious that they're not real live ammo. It's my green, it's just ugly. Oh my goodness, you're not gonna mistake the two. And the other thing is, is I now have a barrel block. It's something that I got previously for the other gun in 45. Well, I just today received my train safe barrel block and there's a link for it in the show notes. And basically it's an orange plastic dowel sort of thing that goes into the barrel and it sticks out the end. You can actually see it, but it doesn't stick out far enough to interfere with your holster and it prevents anything from chambering into the gun. You have to disassemble the gun to put it in, which means naturally you have to disassemble it to take it out. So as soon as you put that in there, you got a little orange tip sticking out of the pistol and you can't chamber a live round, you could load live ammo into your, not that I would suggest you do this, but you could stick the magazine with live ammo and try to rack the slide and rack in a round, and it's just going to get jammed up on this orange barrel block. So that renders the gun completely safe. There's just nothing you're going to do that's going to make that gun go off. Safety is important. Follow your rules, but you do have to dry fire. If you're going to get better, you got to do it. I mean, how are you going to practice reloads? How are you going to practice drawing from the holster? How are you going to practice any of this stuff if you don't, I mean, like nobody has enough ammo to do it all live, right? So have you ever gone to a match, Aaron, or are you planning to go shoot IDPA or anything like that? I have never shot. Um, I might sometime in the future. I don't know. I need to get better first. I would describe my pistol shooting as functional and that's about it. Hopefully when I attend the MAG-40 class in February next year, I'll have a little bit more confidence in my shooting, and and maybe then, but uh, I I think the two main reasons here that are keeping me from it are, first of all, I don't quite have the disposable income to go to an IDPA match and pay the fee and pay the gas and then go through 100 or however many rounds, and also I'm still nervous about my shooting, and I don't know how well I would do knowing that there are people who are watching me shoot and judging me and giving me a score over it. Judging you? Like, you know, all the people who cheered for you at GRPC, those people judging you? No, I mean, like, the guy who's actually watching me shoot, and... (sighs) Yeah... Look, I I don't say it makes sense. It's just how I feel. And I'm always worried that the people watching me are going, what the hell are you doing? No, that's awful. You're (laughs) stupid. You shouldn't have a gun. And, you know, I just I want to have more confidence in how I shoot before I subject myself to that. Well, that's one of the things that, again, Luke of Triangle Tactical and Ben, when he was on the show, they just went over and over and over again. It's like, you don't need to practice you don't need to get better to shoot a match. What you need is the equipment. You need a mag pouch for two mags. You need three total magazines. You need a holster and you need a gun. And then you need something to go over the top of it so that they can't see all of that while you're standing there on the line. Honestly, I've seen some people that had, they were down to the point where I wasn't sure they had any business owning a gun and they have showed up at IDPA matches and they're walked through, talked through, just how to do what they need to do. 
and they go on to have a good match because you're not going to win. I'm not going to win. I'm unlikely to win anytime in the next couple of years, no matter how hard I practice, because there's always like 10, 15 people better. But what I do get is a lot of support. If you showed up at a basketball match and like walked out on the court and said, hey, I want to (laughs) play and you got demolished, how much support would you get? You'd get laughed at, right? Your YouTube video would go viral and not in a good way. Yeah, exactly. You get mocked and everybody laugh at you because anytime you're in a sport where everybody's competing at the same time, then you have to have some level of equivalent skill or you're just going to get demolished. Yeah, see, and that's what I'm afraid of. That's why I don't want to go shooting yet because I'm not good enough and I don't want to be laughed at. And see, that's kind of the funny thing is, is we have the national champion open USPSA shooter living right in this area. He actually lives in Apex, but his gun store is just north of the Garner Raleigh line in Raleigh. The guy is as good as it is possible to be in pistol shooting. And you can go to a USPSA match in this area and you can be on the same squad as him and you can shoot right before him or right after him. You can talk to him. You are in the same competition he is. And no matter how bad you suck, you can't mess up his day unless you do something stupid and shoot him. But seriously, that's not going to happen either. You can compete, compete, with the best in the world. Like Todd Jarrett shows up at some of these matches. You can compete with the best shooters in the entire world and you're not messing up their day. In fact, they will actually help you. If you ask, if you say something, hey, can you watch me? A lot of these guys will be like, oh, okay, well, have you tried this? And they'll give you the tips. It'd be like taking a clinic with Michael Jordan, right? Just watch the guy a few and you're going to get better. Okay. I am always surprised really that just how supportive. I mean, they're gun people. They're the same people that we went to GRPC, the same people we're going to see at NRA annual meeting. They are the same exact people and they're that way out on the range. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, I'm glad you you made your first match. Uh, you know, they'll hold your hand. They'll teach you everything you need to know. And I mean, I remember my first match. I don't know what the heck I was doing. I showed up and they basically had to hold my hand through the whole thing. And they were perfectly happy to do it because it was like, Oh, you're coming to join our little club. Hey, this is going to be great. I've got another person. So I would really suggest if you get a chance, if you know, you've got to shoot a hundred rounds at some point, and that's about what you're going to shoot in an IDPA match, six, six stages, max of 18 rounds each. So, I mean, figure about a hundred rounds. The next time you have a hundred rounds and 15 or 20 bucks, seriously, go to a match, let them hold your hand all the way through it. They'll be super nice to you. I've never been to a match where they weren't super nice. And just give it a shot. And that goes for everybody, not just Aaron. Give it a shot. Get out there. Let us know how it goes. And if you want to listen to a podcast mostly about competition shooting, check out Triangle Tactical Podcast. This week, Tiffany has a special message just for Aaron. Um, She thought about sending it as a private email, but then figured it would be far better to embarrass her in front of the entire gun blog variety cast listening audience. Oh, dear. (laughs) <laughs> that way, we have witnesses, and more importantly, all our listeners can pitch in to keep reminding Erin that it's time she sheds certain phrases from her vocabulary. Oh, God, I have a bad feeling about this. You know, that might be one of those phrases, Erin. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view. Till you climb inside of his skin, walk around in it. Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well and having a great week. Sorry, I've been a little MIA lately. I've been busy watching Vikings. The new season just started. I'm just kidding. I wasn't watching Vikings. I was grading papers and writing briefs and watching Vikings. But I have also been watching and listening in awe of the sheer unstoppable explosion of awesomeness that is Operation Blazing Sword. And while I'm super excited about the new nonprofit tax exempt status and the exponential growth and volunteers and interest and all that, those amazing feats have been blunted in my mind by another refrain that is constantly competing to overshadow them. That is this rumor that Erin doesn't know what she's doing. Now, who started this rumor? You guessed it, Erin Paulette herself. Of course, nobody believes this hogwash except Aaron. So why, oh why, does Aaron keep trying to convince us that she doesn't know what she's doing? Okay, 
So I decided to take this segment and speak directly to my good friend, Aaron Pallett. Dear Aaron, I want to share with you something that was written by a 20th century poet. She was born in 1928. And before she found her voice as a poet, ironically, she was a mute. She was mute and did not speak at all for many years. Now, as a child, she was raped by an adult friend of the family, and she told her family. And days later, her rapist was found murdered, probably by members of her family, although we don't know that for sure. And she felt guilty about this. She felt that by speaking out, she had caused another human being's demise, even though that human being had brutalized her viciously. And so for that reason, she stopped talking at all for several years throughout her adolescence. And instead, she began reading. And that's where the seeds of her voice were planted. Now, those seeds would take many years to grow, and she cycled through several different occupations before really embracing that voice as a poet. She was a prostitute. She was a nightclub dancer. She was a cook. She also danced professionally for a time with one of my personal idols, Alvin Ailey. She spent time as a journalist, a singer, an actor. She became a civil rights leader. She traveled the world. And eventually that strong voice that had built up inside of her and had been cultivated by all of these diverse experiences, it just burst out. It leapt out onto the page in an autobiographical piece called I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. So yes, if you hadn't guessed by now, this poet's name is Marguerite Johnson. She used to go by Rita. But nowadays, most people know her as the late, the great Maya Angelou. And this is one of her most famous poems. I'm sure you've heard it before, but I'm going to play it for you all the same, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Everyone in the world has gone to bed one night or another with fear or pain or loss or disappointment. And yet each of us has awakened, arisen, uh, somehow made our ablution, seen other human beings, and said, morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, and you? It's amazing. Wherever that abides in the human being, there is the nobleness of the human spirit. Despite it all, black and white, Asian, Spanish, Native American, pretty, plain, thin, fat, Vow to celibate, we rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like suns and like moons, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. <laughs> As if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh, does it come as a surprise that I dance as if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave, and so, naturally, there I go rising. So Aaron, 
The next time you feel the urge to lament how you don't know what you're doing, please, I beg of you, just pause before those words come out of your mouth or trickle off your fingers. And instead, remind yourself what Blazing Sword is and how quickly it's blossomed. Now, what is the cause of this tremendous growth? Hmm? Let's take a vote, okay? All right, let's take a vote. Everybody, how many of you think that Blazing Sword is being held back by some incompetent neophyte flailing around in the dark who is her own worst enemy? Raise your hand if you believe that. That's what I thought. Zero hands raised. And anybody who possibly maybe contemplated for one half nanosecond potentially raising your hand, you can suck it. Okay, now, how many of you think that Blazing Sword is soaring because of the passion and drive and determination and tenacity of a smart, amazing woman named Erin Paulette? Raise your hand. Yeah. So like 50 million people just raised their hand. And Aaron, I hope your hand is raised too. Now, of course, you're not alone. You have supporters and helpers and people who believe in you who are supporting the cause. But let's not kid ourselves. Blazing Sword would not be here without Aaron Paulette. I didn't think of the idea. Sean didn't think of the idea. Hell, and even if we did, we didn't actually do it. You did. That's no small potatoes. Whether you knew exactly how to do this or not, you did it. You did it, Aaron. It is. It is happening right now because of you and all of the people that you inspired. So congratulations. Be proud and stop saying you don't know. Give yourself permission to, as Maya Angelou says, walk like you've got oil wells pumping in your living room. And if anybody has a problem with that, you just send them over to me and we can step outside and have a little chat, okay? <laughs> so till next time, stay humble. And I love that about you, Aaron. Stay humble, but enjoy your accomplishments and claim them unabashedly. And while you're at it, stay safe, stay fucking awesome, and keep it centered and even. You can follow Tiffany at FrontSightPress.com. Okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I was legitimately worried that I had offended Tiffany somehow and that I needed to apologize. So thank you, Tiffany. I needed to hear that. And please don't hurt me because I raised my hand <laughs> to your first question. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron Paulette. Come on, everypony! It's time for Blue Collar Prepping with Erin Paulette. So the other day, I was walking our dogs with my mom when she noticed some rain clouds on the horizon and said, I wish I knew a way to look at clouds and determine how far away they are. I thought this was a great idea for a prepping segment, and I began to research it. As it turns out, though, there's no good way to estimate cloud distance with the naked eye because it's impossible to tell how large clouds are without, you know, radar. Objects without reference can be deceptively large, which is why the moon can look so huge when you see it up in the sky, but appears to get smaller when you see it behind some trees. It doesn't actually change in size, it's just that seeing the trees gives your eye a reference point and our brains can then estimate the scale. But there are some cool tricks you can use to estimate things in the sky, and the best part is that you don't need special tools to do it, you only need your hands. Now, the first thing you can do is estimate the time until sunset using just your fingers. So first, you extend your arm out in front with your palm facing you, and you put your index finger under the sun. Now, obviously, don't look directly at the sun, dumbass. Each finger width between the sun and the horizon is approximately 15 minutes of daylight. Now, the closer you are to the equator, the more true this is. If you're closer to the poles you'll have a variable amount of time. You should practice this now so that you know how many minutes each finger actually gives you in your location. If you live very far north, you might have 18 minutes per finger. And when you have only two hours of sunlight left, you should start making shelter for the night. But Aaron, you have tiny hobbit hands, and I have large manly hands. Wouldn't your smaller fingers say that you have more time than mine will? 
Now, you'd think so, right? But you'd be mistaken. You see, nearly everyone's fingers are proportional to their arm length. So my small fingers on small hands are attached to equally small arms. So that means when I extend my arm out, my hand isn't as far away from my face as your hand is from your face. And so because it's closer, my fingers appear thicker against the horizon. Neat, huh? Now I mentioned that the time varies depending on how close you are to the equator. And this distance is known as latitude, and you can also measure your latitude using your fingers and the night sky. So again, stretch your hand out at arm's length, and a closed fist is 10 degrees. The distance between your index finger and your little finger, like if you're throwing heavy metal horns, that's 15 degrees. The distance between your thumb and little finger, the classic Hawaiian hang loose symbol, that's 25 degrees. And your three middle fingers, the classic Boy Scout salute, that's five degrees across. And your little finger is a single degree. So to determine your latitude, just find the North Star, and there's a link on how to do that in the show notes, and you measure the distance from it to the visible horizon, and that's your latitude in degrees. And using this trick, you can not only get an idea of how far north you are, but you can also look at faraway objects on the horizon and determine how far apart they are in navigational degrees. Now, you can't use it to tell you how far away something is, but it's a good way to tell how far apart two objects on the horizon are, and that will give you a good idea of their scale. Not only can you subscribe or donate to the podcast, you can also make a contribution to the LGBT Training Ammo Fund. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the LGBT Training Ammo Fund donation button in the right sidebar. I'll use this money to pay for range fees, targets, and yes, ammo for the people I teach. And thanks for your support. I think we're going to have to change that one because I think it might be best to just start sending money to Blazing Sword. I am waiting to hear back from my financial consultant because I want to make absolutely sure before I tell people this that they can send us a receipt for their ammo expenditures and we'd send them a thank you for their donation. So until I get that ironed out, let's keep the uh, LGTBQ ammo fund thing running. And as soon as that changes, I'll let you know. All right. Warning. Weird found some of the dumbest words ever spoken by anti-gun nuts. Use caution when listening to this episode because the derp is thick in This This Week week in in Anti-Gun Nuttery. So hey, Weird, what do you got for me this week? So wow, this may be some of the dumbest stuff I've ever covered here. And in 122 episodes, that's saying something. Let's dive right in. New at 6, the NBC2 investigators uncover a flaw in Florida's gun check system. 300,000 people have bought guns in the last four months, but in the same time frame, only 100,000 people have gotten their licenses to carry. What? Okay, I get that this is NBC News, but we're still not talking the Onion or Weekly World News. How do they fit so much wrong in two sentences? Of course, any rational human being knows that a carry permit is not required to own a gun. Well, unless you live in Massachusetts. Also, even taking this insane speculation at face value, a Florida carry permit is good for seven years. Further, Florida sells all kinds of guns. You could buy handguns, you could buy rifles, you could buy shotguns. But you can't open carry unless you're actively hunting, fishing, or camping, or returning home from one of those activities. So if you're buying a rifle, a shotgun, or a Desert Eagle, you aren't carrying that thing. At least not in Florida. So do the other 200,000 people already had their licenses? Are they carrying illegally? Well, that's a problem no one really knows for sure. Oh my god, the horror! Or maybe they just own the guns. Or maybe they're carrying without a permit. I don't recommend that. But with 10 plus states and counting that don't require permits to carry, and no issues coming from those states... I'm really not concerned with people carrying without a proper permit. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement is responsible for gun purchases, but the Department of Agriculture is responsible for concealed weapon permits. So this means FDLE can give you the okay to buy a gun, even if the Department of Agriculture says you can't carry it. And why might the Department of Agriculture say you can't carry a gun, but the Department of Law Enforcement says you can legally own the gun? Maybe because you didn't apply for the permit. 
In Florida, once you pass an FDLE background check, you can buy a rifle or a shotgun on the spot. The same rules apply when you buy a handgun. Only you have to wait three days to take that gun home. I don't think that there's anything wrong with a three-day wait. I put this in for two reasons. Number one, I hate when I hear people say that places like Texas and Florida are the most gunny of gun friendliest gun states in the universe. They're nice. And as a Massachusetts resident, they're really nice. But I'm from Maine, where we don't bother with any of that crap. And now we don't even require carry permits. Number two, why would anybody think a waiting period after an instant background check was a good idea? This isn't a cooling off period. The original waiting period law was put in place because the Brady background checks were done via postal mail, before the instant check system supplanted it. Second, I traded guns with my father-in-law in Florida. I bought him a very nice Glock 19 in exchange for his vintage carry gun, a Smith & Wesson Model 66. He walked into the store with a gun, and then had to wait three days to walk out with a different gun because he doesn't have his carry permit. How does that make any sense? I went through the concealed carry application process myself, and I learned it's lengthy and expensive. Since I have family in Florida, and the Florida carry permit is almost as good as the famous Utah carry permit, I decided to get one for myself. I had to complete a firearms training course. Now every other situation can be gray. That cost me $90. Then I had to apply in person. It took me three weeks to get an appointment here at the Lee County Tax Collector's office. They reviewed my application, took my photo, and scanned my fingerprints. That cost me another $100. What? To get my permit, it literally took me an afternoon. The class portion was so inexpensive, I forgot what it cost. Then I drove to a Department of Agriculture office and was fingerprinted and got my picture taken, and I paid the $100 license fee. A few weeks later, my license arrived. I renewed this spring when I was visiting family, and it was even easier then. Seriously, she didn't research the law, and she didn't even research how to properly get your damn permit. As for me, I'm waiting for the Department of Ag to approve my application. In the meantime, I and thousands of others, like Lisa, can buy as many guns as the FDLE allows. After all, no one knows how many people legally buy guns they cannot legally carry. Man, she finishes as poorly as she started. Unless she's a felon, she's going to get a permit. How many guns will the Florida Department of Law Enforcement allow her to get? As many as she damn wants. Is there any surprise that this crack reporter is a transplant to the great state of Florida from the state of New York? All right, Weird. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Okay, a few things about this from the Floridian. I wasn't born here, but I've lived here 25 years, so I'm pretty sure I've been naturalized. So first, Weird does have his facts correct. Secondly, when I got my permit, I just went to the local police station to get fingerprinted and photographed. I don't remember how much it cost, but it wasn't much. And I didn't even have to make an appointment. I just walked in and waited. And then I mailed my application to the Florida Department of Agriculture. I didn't have to go to a place. I just put it in the mail. And it only cost me $75, but this was back in 2012, and things may have changed. Third, if you have a Florida concealed weapons permit, you don't have to wait three days for a handgun purchase, just FYI. And finally, the link to that NBC article in the show notes no longer works. I expect that Channel 2 News got tired of the drubbing it was taking in the comments about how stupid that segment was, and they just (laughs) memory hold it out of embarrassment. Yeah, I don't blame them. Wow. That was just dumb. (laughs) So, so dumb. Plug of the week, the Streamlight Stylus Pro. I got a new flashlight. (laughs) Yay, new toys. When I went down to buy some ammo, the evil people at Cabela's had put this Streamlight Stylus Pro flashlight. It is a two AAA battery pen light. Metal. I mean, this sucker's tough. You could beat somebody with it. It is brutal. I, I carry it around in my back pocket. It starts off at 80 lumens. It's probably about a 60 lumen flashlight for most of its lifespan. It is just fantastic little pen light. It is about the size of a Sharpie, maybe a little bit thicker than that. It's two AAA batteries that it takes and it comes with AAA batteries. So you don't even have to pay for new ones. 
It is just a fantastic little light. And I only consider buying it because Luke from Triangle Tactical. This is the Luke from Triangle Tactical show, isn't it? Like I've mentioned him how many times now? <laughs> just get a room, you two. Seriously. Oh, just I'm kiss already. You. He plugged it a long time ago. And I was like, yeah, Luke said that was a good flashlight. It was 16 bucks. Like, well, how can I pass that up? I'll give it a try. Limited lifetime warranty. So like anything else that Streamlight makes, if you break it, they'll give you a new one. So give it a try. I've got a link in the show notes that'll take you to a bunch of different Streamlight Stylus Pro flashlights. They're running 16 to 18 bucks, depending on what color it is and whether it's some funny color camouflage or something, whatever. I got a little red one and I've been carrying it around in my back pocket next to my wallet. I can't carry it around in my front pocket because that's where I carry around my Spyderco Delica with the Emerson opener on it. So, I mean, you can't put two things hooked to your pocket, not on the same side. So it just sits in my back pocket next to my wallet. And I guess the only problem is remembering to take it out before I throw it in the wash. So check it out in the show notes. You're looking 16, 18 bucks on Amazon. It's a fantastic little light. So I have one question. You are the purple guy. Why did you get a red light? Because my wife's colors are blue and green. So if it's blue or green, it's pretty much going to be hers. And so my backup color, since not a lot of things are made in purple, is red. If I have a choice, I'll get the purple. If I don't have a choice on purple, the next best color is red. Okay, then. Well, that's our show for the week. Remember that the Gun Blog Variety Cast is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 122. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. It's late Saturday night or Sunday morning, and I just got back from the Shoot to Live IDPA match at Personal Defense and Handgun Safety Center in Raleigh, North Carolina. This was the first time I ever put live rounds out of my new SIG P320 Compact, and I really liked it. I was worried that the sights might not be quite right, but it turns out they're pretty good, if you can see them. I shot Remington UMC 115 grain 9mm that I had purchased myself. The match went pretty well. I got one miss on a stage where I had to move and only had limited rounds. I saw the sights weren't really on target, and if I'd had some extra rounds, I'd have taken a makeup shot, but hmm, I couldn't. For those who understand these things, it was a six-stage match, and I was down 13 for the match. Eight of those downs were on the one stage, the one with the miss. For never having shot the gun before, I was impressed about how accurate it was for me. The gun is bone stock, complete with the stock sights, and I'm serious, I've never shot the gun before. The first shot I ever took with that gun was kneeling down through a six-inch diameter hole cut in a plywood Christmas tree. My final result was 16 out of 29. Not bad, but not spectacular either. It was about what I expected. I'd like to get some live fire in so I can figure out what my actual level of skill with the gun is. I was pretty conservative in how I shot the match, and except for the stage while I missed a headshot while moving, I was pretty accurate. I'd like to see how much faster I can go without losing any accuracy. Going forward, I think I'm going to block off the second Saturday of each month to shoot the H2O Foul Farms IDPA match. I've been thinking seriously about going to that match for a while now, and I think it's probably time that I just put it in my calendar and do it every month. Well, see you guys next week. This is a URS production.